Okay, afternoon everybody. Uh, I'm Lee, who put a voice to the uh, to the name. And I'm Nick. NTMRC, so we're the National Track Material and Recycling Centre. Uh, down at Whitemoor, we have uh, the FMC facility, which deals with switches and crossings. We have the MHD, which deals with material, getting material hands in depot. So that deals with railway material, sleepers, um, any smalls, rail. And then we have the AHD, which is aggregate hands in depot. So that deals with all the spoil, new ballast, um, <laughs> um, so the contents today, we've got a tiny slide about the history of Whitemore, uh, where Whitemore is today, the Whitemore FMC recycling, recycling facility, what we do there, um, and then what the future is for us, um, Whitemore FMC uh, recovery and the circular economy. So first one, the history of Whitemore. So for anybody who doesn't know, we are actually in uh, East Anglia in Cambridgeshire. We're in a little market town called March. Um, we're in the Fens. It's very flat. We don't see many hills around there. So, But back in World War II, the marshalling yards at uh, Whitemore were the second biggest in Europe. Um, so it's a big site. It's now split up into different sections. We've got a lot of the old original railway is now Whitemore Prison, HMP Prison, uh, Capri One Prison, and then you've got the big marshalling yards and network rail depot there and there as well. Um, so, say in Second World War, Whitemore was an important marshalling yard in the Cambridge countryside where freight trains would bring or load up with goods for distribution. It was so vital for the supply chain that a decoy site was marked not far away and it was all lit up so that if any of the bombers were coming over they would bomb that site and not the actual marshalling yard itself because it was so important during that time. Whitemore continued as a marshalling yard from the 1920s to the 1980s but then it laid dormant until 2004 and then it was phased re reinduction of the site began. The marshalling yard reopened and in 2011 so did the recycling plant, bringing with it a new opportunity to use railway materials. It was Network Rail's national delivery service, now Route Services, that took the decision to open this new facility. Previously, various contractors dealt with different recovered materials, but the national delivery service realised it could coordinate nationally to get the best value for Network Rail, and Whitemore was chosen as an ideal site for the facility required. And the reason for that is We've got good rail connections to the East Coast Main Line. We're, we're very close to that, so we can get there. And we've also got good connections down to Ipswich, down to the ports and places like that. So we're situated in a very good location rail, for rail purposes. Uh, this is just an overview of a big, I believe it was a helicopter that flew over and took this one for us. Um, and you've got the marshalling yards there on the right hand side. You can see the prison in the distance. It takes up, but all of that used to be the railway originally. Um, and then the yard in the middle, the part to the left of the where the sidings are, that is where the MHD, the SNC, and the AHD for network rail is situated. So white more today. Uh, we've got a short video for you now. It's only a minute long and it'll just show you an aerial view of what white might actually look like at present. It's only a bit of music. It's <laughs> only a touch of music. Top left hand corner is the parking facility. Uh, 
Uh, so there's just a photo of the um, top. You can see in the top the green building that's in the top corner, uh, top right hand corner. That's the SNC facility. Um, looks rather small compared to the rest of the site, but that's where the SNC is um, stored and reworked. And then in the very top right hand corner, you can just see where the AHD is, the ballast and the soil. Um, and then the main part is the MHD, which you see most of the um, most of the photo, you can see the track panels and the sleepers that are stored to the left hand side. Um, today, the recycling in Martian Yard have a mutual and cooperative relationship at Whitemore. So, we work really closely with GB Rail Freight, who actually run the Martian Yard side of things. Um, Every day there are deliveries of ballast, track panels, sleepers, rail, small steel components and switches and crossing units into Whitemore and they come via road or rail. Um, so they every day. Every day we've got stuff coming in and going out. Uh, materials are graded and sorted into what we can recycle within the infrastructure and what can be uh, sold out to approved external dealers. Um, so some of our stuff does go back into um, the infrastructure, into the railway infrastructure, some of it goes out to external suppliers um, or gets dealt with scrapped if it, if it needs scrapping. In addition to all of that, the site is also um, environmentally protected in some areas. There's a what's called the bath cave. Yeah, yeah we've, got, we've got a um, We've got a, a big area, we've got two big balancing ponds, uh, which are completely sealed off, and they are for wildlife. We have some um, some areas built for sand martins, because we have a lot of sand martins over there, so we have area built for that. We have a bat cave, which is an old uh, war pillbox, which was, has been inhabited by bats. So they've surrounded it with soil, um, as now we've got nice grass over the top of it. And then they put some grid over the front so the bats can still get in and out. Um, but that's all protected. And we also have a massive nature area which has got newt fencing all around it because we have newts inhabit there as well. So, And you're not allowed in there. Um, the only people that ever go in there are the environmental team that go in there because they collect data from the butterflies and the newts and all of the other uh, animals that live in there. So, yeah, it is very environmentally friendly. So, as I say, I'm a, a S and C technician. So basically, I work directly in the S and C facility. Um, and what we can do there, we're there for refurbishment and recycling of switches and crossings. Um, and it's one of the key functions at Whitemore. We are the only department, the S and C department at Whitemore, that can do what we do. Um, and we're a very small team. We're just a team of four, with two technicians and two operatives. Um, and we are, the two technicians, we are, we weld and grind. So we're the ones that rework the crossings. Um, <coughs> the reason why we're there, manufacturing time for new S&C can have long lead times, which makes responding to emergencies difficult and potentially resulting in high, high delay costs. Of Whitemore, we not only refurbish stock, we also hold um, brand new emergency uh, patterns. So we hold standard patterns, standard geometry crossings, but we can get a crossing out same day. Um, if we get a phone call in the morning to say they've got a crack, crack crossing in track, we can have it ready the same day. They can send a lorry and we'll have it ready within four or five hours. Sort of thing. So. In that respect, we can, in an emergency case, we can get something out very quickly, which then helps, obviously, delay minutes and getting the track back up and running full speed. Um, so, yeah, we have an array of new and we have an array of recovered S&C as well. And a lot of the recovered S&C, we get some of it that comes back is um, recovered unused. So it's stuff that's maybe been used as strategic spares, it's been laid dormant on the side of the track, but it comes back to us if it's no longer needed. Um, we will tidy it up, give it a new lease of life, but it's never been installed. And then we get the stuff that has been installed, that's been pulled out, 
we will um, inspect it and then we'll say whether it's financially viable to recycle it. So if it needs a little bit of grinding, a little bit of welding to it, we can do that. We can make it all uh, like brand new again, pretty much. And then that can be used back out in the infrastructure again. Um, White more F and C has been able to utilise their stock levels to refurbish what they have and solve a problem on the network. This takes less time to do than waiting for a new one and to be made in effect can reduce the length of speed restrictions on our network. All of the F and C that we refurbish, we do it to a standard, um, the standard there of 063, um, and that is the recycling and reuse of switches and crosses. And this document covers F and C layouts, sub-assemblies, and components which are not in um, as new condition but are being considered for insulation into running on the side. What that means is, is some of the stuff that we've refurbished, um, once it's been refurbished, it can only go category four to six track. Um, it can't go higher unless dispensation is used. Um, we have had some of our items used. They can't get a brand new one. Um, for a considerable amount of time, so they will dispensate and put in one wheel fit that we've got in, so at least it can get back up to a better line speed and then <coughs> go new ones made. So that's a, a temporary measure, or could that would that be a permanent? That would be a, that would be if it was in a category four to six, yeah. it would be permanent. Yeah. Uh, but if it was higher than four, so if it was one A down to three, yeah. then that would be just temporary. So what they would do is. Um, if it's going to say 20 weeks for a new crossing, they will put that one in for 20 weeks. As soon as the new one's there, they will take that one out and put a new one in. But it'll just, instead of there being a five mile an hour speed restriction, they could run it up to 40 mile an hour. So it will just I'm say, it goes, uh, yeah, yeah, no, because it's been reworked as stuff, it's already had use, but we've re <coughs> reworked it and uh, put it back out there. It can only be out there for, until they, until they get their new one in. Yeah. And that's what they'll dispensate against. They'll say, right, it can go in, but only until the new one's ready to install. Just to add to that, I think if, if we get, like Lee has mentioned, sometimes you get something that's almost brand new return to the white one. In that situation, the standard doesn't allow you to put it cut one track at the minute, but I think if there's um, a bit more flexibility in the standard, you've got that scenario, we've got the history of the actual process that very little use, then potentially we could put it back into the standard needs to change to actually adjust to, to help that. Okay, so what are the current capabilities of the FTC recycling facility? So we can assess and refurbish all the full depth, shallow depth and bullet switches, sizes A to B. Um, we can assess and refurbish the crossings, acute and obtuse, um, fabricated, part welded, and cast manganese CMX um, stocking. We stock, we stock crossings, we stock switches, we stock covered check rails, expansion switches, free or adjustment switch. Um, <laughs> yeah, terminology. Um, and then we can also. Within our workshop, we've got a um, Menke press, so we can radius uh, leg ends or switches, uh, radius rail, and we can also um, make it straight. If they've got radius in, they need to be straight, so we can do that as well. Um, we've got a milling machine, um, so to save on our halves and um, dust, pollution, things like that, we've got a milling machine. It's so much quicker. Less noise, it's less look dirt, less apps on the employee. It's and it's so quick as well. <laughs> it takes a while to set up, but it is quick. Um, with timber layers with base plates, so we can supply crossings because crossings obviously and switches go out either on timber or on concrete bearers. We also keep um, base plates as well. So if it's going out on timber, we will fully base plate a crossing to go out. It will have brand new pads, brand new clips, brand new ferrules, and it'll all be clipped up in the position that they're meant to be. So when it goes to site, the idea is they can literally lift it off, put it straight on, bolt it down, it's ready to go. Um, currently, 
at the SNC facility, because of the machines we've got, we can only um, cope up to 21 metres in length. We can't, because of our forklift and the frame we've got, we can't support anything over that currently, but we are in the process of having a new frame built so that we could take up to 26 metres. Um, so we can deal with, deal with slightly longer SNC. Um, the picture you can see on the slide, that is of our power turn. So that, as you can see, we've got the crossing at the moment. We can rotate a crossing 360 degrees. So we can basically, at the moment the crossing's on its side, we can put it upside down. And the reason why we do that is when we are looking at one that's come back into us, that's been recovered to us, we can actually die penetrate or MPI the entire bottom of the crossing to make sure that there's no underlying issues underneath, which you can't see on track nine times out of ten, but with us, that's how far we go. So, yeah, there's a picture, the centre picture there is of the crossing upside down, so you see the underneath of the crossing. Um, the picture to the right is the Nenki press, so you see it attached to uh, a leg end there. And the picture on the left is our new stock, so that's all of the stock. Um, it's hard to get it all in. We've got, I think we've got on stock at the moment, we've got roughly 350 brand new crossings um, on stock, which we can use for emergencies. All in all, I think in the yard, all of the SNC components we've currently got, we've probably got around the region about 800 units, um, refurbished ones, one going to be refurbished and brand new homes. As part of the SNC stocking strategy, is although we've got a lot of the bespoke, uh, the standard straight SNC held at Whitehall, we have a strategy that we're working on uh, more bespoke products. Um, so we're working with several routes across the country to develop a stock holding of golden assets effectively, um, just to reduce that delay time if something does go wrong, you've got something in hand. Um, as you can see, Whitemore is looking pretty full, so we will need to find an alternative location for that. But for the straightforward stuff, it's really handy having it at Whitemore, where the guys with the knowledge of S&T can just bring it in the workshop, give it a once-over, make sure everything is good to go, and then dispatch back out. Everything's quality control as well. So before anything leaves us, um, it does go through a um, 1053 or a 1054 standard. Um, so it does go with a certificate of conformity and an inspection certificate, um, and that is done by trained, qualified personnel as well. So anything that leaves us is 100% is it, it's good to go. And as we're a small team, we're really passionate about it as well. So we know that nothing goes out of there unless it's, unless it's done really well to a very high standard. So the Nenki press that was on the previous slide is approved for use in track and the only operators permitted to use it in track are the white mall operators. Um, so if anybody did have a call out for something to be curved in track, I suppose you could think of it as the old Jim Crow. Um, this is now the approved item for pressing out in track and the team can come out and assist with that. We've used it several times. We've been out to a couple of run throughs where they've run through a set of switches and it's bent the blade over. And instead of going out and putting a whole new set of switches in, we've managed to go out with an Nenki press and actually get it pressed back so it fits back up nice and so it can still be reused. So there's a few times we've been out with that. We've been out to a couple of switches, brand new switches that have been installed and they weren't lining up quite correctly and it was just they'd just been mishandled at some point, and because of the length of them, when they were put in, they just didn't sit right. But we went out with an empty press, and within a few hours, it was back up and it was in shape. So it is something that we can do, and it is approved to be used. So it's a good bit of kit. Okay, so the pictures you see there are um, 
of what we've done with our milling machine. Um, the two pictures, the, the left-hand picture and the middle picture, we actually had an obtuse crossing come back to us that had cracks in the underneath. So the benefit of us having the PAL turn where we can flip it upside down, um, you can actually see we've milled it out, but there was cracks in the underneath pockets. Um, our milling machine managed to mill it, mill it, mill it all out, and um, we've managed to weld it back up again. It would just be for temporary, like literally just to get them out of trouble, because it was quite a bespoke casting, so it was going to be quite a long lead time to get one made. So it was it was done as a trial just to see. It, it's not going to last forever because of how severe the cracks were, but we managed to get weld on there and make it strong enough to, to go back in. Um, and the picture on the right is just, um, we've milled a defect out, and that's the finish we get with our milling machine. Um, as a welder, it's, it's brilliant because it's nice and flat, it's nice and level, it's nice and smooth. The only thing we have to do by hand is we just have to step the ends out so that there's no right angle end left or um, slab traps for the welding. So we, um, they're the only bits we have to do by hand and then we can weld it. And then we can use our milling machine to actually take the topping off and we're just in the process of setting it up. So with a crossing, um, the crossing nose is tapered dependent on the angle of the crossing. Um, we're actually setting the milling machine up so it will do that for us. So we will, we've got marks on there. So if it's a one in eight, we can set it to a one in eight and then we can run the milling machine and it'll actually put the taper on for us as well. So it's something that we used to have to do by hand. The only other thing we have to do by hand is just put the races back on the rail profile when we're done because it won't do that. So that is something we have to finish by hand. But other than that, the milling machine has been um, a really good item for us to have, a really good item for us to have. Um, going forward, in the future, it would be nice. We are looking at possibly getting um, CNC fitted to our milling machine, which it can be done, it can be retrofitted to it. Um, and the idea behind that is fabricated crossings. We're actually want to look at using um, recovered rail and actually fabricating our own uh, work, part will be crossing. So uh, fabricated crossings, actually making all of the sections up ourselves, all of the part, all the components up. Um, that is something, not yet, but it's something down in the future that would be, and mainly that would be for um, sidings. Like for instance, Whitemore sidings has got, I think it's got something like 52 uh, one in eight BB layouts. So the idea is we would like to make, be able to process our own fabricated crossing. They take one out, put one of ours in, before the one that they've already got in is too far gone. And then we can refurbish that one so you've got a bit of a rolling stock. Um, it'd be mainly for sidings, um, for the sidings they do use a lot of fabricated a bit cheaper. Um, so that is something that we are Hopefully, looking at for the future. Not quite yet. It's <coughs> one thing that I wanted to add with what she's going to talk about now. Lee's been talking about SP has been recovered and refurbished and it's got the other. It's not happening at the moment. So, renewals at the moment, we do two to three hundred units of SP renewals every year. Currently, none of it is getting back to Whitemore. The reason why is because process, mainly. So effectively, renewal alliances have got obviously quite a lot of pressure on costs, so they've got pressure on possession times and what access they have. They don't factor in trying to recover stuff, they scrap it all out. And thousands and thousands of pounds worth of actually good S and T that's actually been scrapped. Um, mainly down to the fact that they are purely focusing on making sure they get the actual job done in the time they've got without actually incurring any delay, which obviously is going to be a big cost onto the actual job they're doing. Unfortunately, that's been like that for a few years now. So Whitemore has really struggled to have any actual renewal efficacy back to them to actually recover, which is a criminal really when we've got that many new units coming out of the track. So 
this is something that I'm fighting for to try and actually get things changed. We'll talk about that in a little bit further when it comes to looking at the uh, economy stuff. But it really is criminal, to be honest, that we are in this situation. Because obviously, back in the old days, for my time with the railway, it happened from my own stand. Things were recovered, they were looked at and recascaded, etc., as part of the process. But obviously, with the contract system we've got now, that's never been on the agenda. They've just been getting their cheapest cost at the most um, minimum amount of time that required for possession. So, quite a lot of work for us to do to try and reverse that. Do you, um, you maybe need to introduce an internal market so that they actually, the project receives some money? I think. When it, when it sends materials. Just hold that thought for later on. Just a quick bit of feedback. The question is. Feedback to people online is they can hear the presentation brilliantly. Yeah. Um, some of the questions that they're struggling to hear. So you just sort of put your stage voices on when you ask the question. What I would do, Gary, is we give the questions for Vian as well, just yeah. sort of draw the presentation. Yeah. Is that fine? Yeah. Yeah, can I just add to that? Right. No, okay, so you can give the questions for Okay. Right. So. The idea is the more when we first started, we would get in. There would be a slide soon that will show you a graph, which is just tell a lot of stories. Uh, when we first started, we were getting a lot of S and C back, and like Phil said, we're not getting barely anything back now. But if we can get it back, and we can refurbish it, it can be used in emergency situations to get people out of trouble and get the track back up and running. Um, we had a great um, last. Towards the end of last year, there was a derailment down at Sheffield. Um, the derailment happened. By that weekend, we had got them out three half sets of switches and two crossings, and the track was back up and running by Monday. We couldn't have done that, and it wouldn't have been back up and running in time if we didn't have that stuff in stock. So we managed to go within, it weren't even a week of it being down, from the derailment to it being uh, reopened was only about five or six days so it just shows that and we got the stuff out I think we got the call late on a Wednesday afternoon and by Friday they were going out on the lorry for site so it just proves that if we have that stuff back we've got the stuff to be able to send out um, if we don't get it back unfortunately we don't <laughs> uh, makes it hard um, that's the bigger problem we've got with, with the recycling facility being enough renewals actually coming out in particular, getting back to white The issue we've got though is the balancing act at the moment. We've seen all the stock that's actually on the yard at the moment. We've also got limited capability to stock anything at this very time. That needs to change to be able to have that facility there. But obviously the other side of things is if we move to a, a more a, a circular economy, which will go into the detail about what that's talking about shortly, we would need more staff maybe at white more ultimately to actually help refurbish the, the actual stock and make that actually a, a bigger factory, if you like, of how we actually can keep our SSC going from refurbished issues. The one thing that, and the second bullet point there, reduction in carbon footprint, again, we'll come on to that in a little bit more detail, but there's a big issue that's going to be a factor in CP7, which is obviously on the horizon for us in Network Rail, to actually look at our carbon footprint in a lot more detail and probably have some KPIs that mean we have to actually prove to the regulator that we are actually doing <coughs> reducing our carbon footprint and putting actions in place to make sure we can meet that, that sort of level that we're um, tasked to meet. SNC <laughs> recovery can play a huge part in that. Again, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit further when we look at the circular economy issue. Um, what we're also doing is by being able to stop the new pattern stuff and also the um, refurbished and the recovered unused stuff we're actually helping the manufacturers bring their lead times down because instead of them having to supply something in an emergency, if we've got it, we can take that off them and we can, we can supply it. So it's allowing them to bring um, their lead times down as well. So some of the more bespoke castings, they've got time to do them so that you're not waiting 40 plus weeks for it. You're perhaps only waiting 12 weeks for it because we're being able to give that capacity as well. So. Um, that's the other major benefit from it all. Um, the idea of having, especially for um, sidings and things like that, is 
<coughs> we see a lot of the S&C that we have had back at times is beyond economical repair. It's too far gone. We want to try and get away from that. So we want to be able to um, say to them, look, we've got something here that will replace it. Can we have your old one back so that we can refurbish that one? So you've always got something to run with or to help another route out at any point. Um, we don't really want to see it back where it's beyond economical repair because then it's just just a bit of a waste, which we have seen. Uh, we've seen quite a few come back to us that are just they're completely shot. So there's not a lot, there's nothing we can do with those. And it just seems, it seems a bit of a waste, whereas if they changed it a little bit earlier, we could have we could have done something with it. Um, yeah, if we look at the, the bottom section there, it's like a guess to see cover resurfacing. At the moment, we seem to have been fixed in this position for many decades of actually running SSC till it fails. Then we'll do something about it, we'll repair it. And obviously, everything starts going in pear shape because delay minutes start racking up. IMDM's directors get getting excited, and there's a lot of issues to try and keep the pressure off the people to actually get the thing up and running again. What we want to try and do is, is try and change how the perception is for maintenance to look at assets like SNC, in, in particular switches and crossings to have a mindset change, to look at actually taking things out at half-life. So usually now you'd look at that with an IMDM or somebody as an IME, they look at it and go, are you mad? Taking out an SNC unit now, perfectly fine. What's wrong with it? We're going to keep it going. But if we actually start getting to half-life, take it out of track, take it somewhere like Whitemore to refurbish it and bring it back to where it's <laughs> more, um, not necessarily brand new, but as near as, they recycle another SNC Unit, so the actual crossing effectively, you can put another one of those in as a cyclic term maintenance. So basically, you have one that's in track, one that's gone through refurbishment, it comes back and lies track side. The one in track then does 50% life. We take that out, replace it with the one that's been refurbished, send it back to Whitemore, the other one that's been removed, just keep cycling it through, and you could probably get a cycle maybe three or four times before you need to actually replace it. And we wouldn't or shouldn't get an S&C failure of that component because it's not been basically run to death before it actually gets to the stage where it falls over. And that's a, obviously would, a big, would be a big culture change for the industry. Clearly, we've been in this trap of actually running into failure. And that's one of the things we need to get away from, especially where we've, we're moving away from having inspection requirements carried out during the day. We've obviously got lots of pressure on doing work on the night now because of the issue of taking people off track, making sure we aren't actually putting people in harm's way from a safety point of view. So changing our culture in that sense is obviously, from my point of view, the right way to go forward, but clearly it's a big challenge for the industry to see that as a, a benefit rather than actually moving it away from, let's say, get it to fail and then we'll, we'll do something about it then. So there's obviously quite a lot of work to actually um, encourage routes and regions to see things in that sense to uh, get their mindset in place. But we just need one route and region to start looking at this in seriousness to then hopefully show what the benefits would be of doing that. So, as I mentioned earlier, we've got a real problem at the moment because of the recovery of S&C. As you can see from that graph, it was depleted from 2011 when Whitemore started being um, operational basically very, very little last year and even less this year. And obviously the, the biggest problem is getting the change in the alliances to see how they can actually fit this into their possessions to actually look at that. One of the big things that comes out of this is obviously it's going to cost more money. Yeah, okay, there may be a, an additional cost, but effectively if you look at the actual method of changing an SSE unit now, it gets scrapped out. They just use that as a, a quick and easy way of using the equipment to get the things into a wagon to just cart it off to somewhere to get disposed of in some way. But it doesn't come at a free cost. So there's not a case of which the way the system is put in place now of taking stuff out of track, it isn't cost free. That's what seems to be the sort of message I'm hearing from alliances. They don't seem to think of that that is a, an expense in the actual project. Having some more time and actually getting the right equipment to move the SNC out of track in panel form or maybe in, in just um, dismantle form to take the switches and crossings out, yeah, we'll take a little bit more planning to actually get that into the system from the planning point of view for the actual renewal. But 
reality-wise, I don't think it's, it's massive, a massive change to the plans themselves currently. But obviously, it's, it's again, getting in half a mind to see that as an issue that we can hopefully address quite reasonably easily, especially where we're talking about planning ahead in CP7. So we need to actually change that culture to get people to look at how we recycle um, SSC in particular in this case, or track assets in, in general, whether it's SSC or plain line. Because at the moment, we scrap everything. And it's criminal in terms of some of the issues we see um, where certain units come out and they're almost brand new and they could be reused again and costing thousands of pounds. We're just basically throwing them away for, for scrap. And, uh, we get next to nothing for value. I don't know, do you know what sort of, how much we get a ton for scrap? I'm not sure of the numbers. At the moment, scrap value is incredibly high, um, but that's not always been the case. But I think you would get a lot more value about it, an SNC unit if you consider delay. <coughs> So the biggest challenge for actually changing how the alliances do that is looking at how what sort of machinery they need, whether they're taking things out of the panel. And the, the potential is that we can actually look at certain renewals that are planned in CP7, for example, and have a customer for those panels that knows exactly where they need to be. So if this is the case where it needs to go back to Whitemore, you might have somewhere identified in Scotland, for example, where somebody's taking some panels out in the south, and they're transported right up to where they're going to be needed. So it, it takes out the issue of, of Whitemore having to be involved too much, unless there's obviously things that need to be assessed to understand their serviceability. But there's lots of issues that we need to tease out to actually get this planning process much slicker than it is at the moment to be able to actually get the benefits we can from recycling. Okay, next slide. So I've talked about circular economy, which a lot of people might think, well, what on earth is that all about? We've got a circular economy team in the technical authority. So they're looking at really looking to encourage all different departments in Network Rail, not just about S&T and uh, track, mm -hmm. to actually take a circular economy look at how we can get the best out of our assets rather than actually just the linear economy, which we see all too often, where we get resources extracted out of the ground, we make a switch, we make a crossing, after we've actually um, rolled the steel, first of all, of course, then it's transported to a manufacturer to make the S&T take it from there into the yard where it's going to be fitted, then obviously taken to the site where it's going to be installed. After which, after which at the minute, we get to the waste point where we actually do a renewal now, we scrap everything out, it goes into the back of the wagons and it's never seen again. Whether it actually goes into a big black hole and just gets buried, don't know. Obviously there's some of it gets recycled as scrap. Obviously it's not giving us the benefit of those assets that are still serviceable to move forward to actually use them again somewhere else in the uh, network. So the circular economy is really looking at how we can do exactly that. Take an asset, have it put into track. When it comes to either is refurbishing or actually is life expired, we take it out of track, but we don't just throw it away. We assess it to see if we can actually work on it, refurbish it to make it more viable to use it in lower category tracks perhaps, or elsewhere if it's really in good condition. That actually has um, life taken out of it. So the circular economy is, is trying to move away from actually the carbon footprint area where we are really strong in, in the waste that we do at the moment. So if you think of the production of steel, for example, we've got the carbon footprint of how it's taken out as ore, as iron ore taken to from there, taken to a um, steel manufacturer to convert that through the processing to actually make it to steel. So the minute we use, from British Steel's point of view, they've got... Um, Furnaces that are very, very carbon heavy in terms of their process to actually make the steel that we need for our rail. If we can change those to actually electric art furnace, the carbon footprint of one of those is much, much less than anything that's in the steel area at the minute. So potentially that could change the carbon footprint from the manufacturing point of view, but obviously there's a sting in the tail that British Steel would need some investment from the government probably to help pay for a new um, electric art furnace. There is a potential for that to happen soon because they've got two furnaces at a minute, one of them being decommissioned. So we could actually see that change potentially in, in the next few years, obviously government funding permitted from British Steel. If you then take it from there to the S&C manufacturer, they've got a transportation carbon footprint of actually moving the rail from the manufacturers of the rail to the manufacturers of the S&C. Then you make the S&C, 
take it and put it onto a, a wagon to take it from the site that it's manufactured at, out to site to actually where it's going to be installed, then it's installed. So all of those steps have a carbon footprint. And that means that, uh, obviously, if we keep carrying on doing the same thing at the moment where we're scrapping FSC out or track panels out, that carbon footprint being generated every single time we do a renewal. If you look at it from a different point of view where we actually change the focus to refurbish or look at recycling FSC, all the carbon footprint from the manufacturing process is gone because that's already been done. All we need to do is get the, the equipment out of the track, maybe back to white motor, set it, refurbish it if necessary, <coughs> smaller carbon footprint to actually move that out to track then to actually get us to a renewal and actually install it again somewhere else. In the TA, one of my colleagues is actually developing a carbon tool, which is partly out of these work, I think. Um, and this is just an example of a single turnout. It's only a D switch, so it's not exactly uh, a, the longest type of switch we have. In a 756 rail, and looking at the sleepers, uh, the length of rails, and working it through, the bottom figure there <coughs> is how much carbon in kilograms that take to actually manufacture it. So it's a heck of a lot of carbon that we actually generate just for one smaller type of SSE unit. There's lots of savings we can actually create with that. Um, and obviously reducing that, as I've said, taking it out of track and refurbishing it gets rid of all of that carbon. Because reusing it means we don't have to go through all that process again. That's already been taken care of as far as the manufacturing from new. So it's a massive saving just for one switch. Clearly, if we're taking two to 300 out a year, which is current um, sort of numbers we've got, that's a huge amount of carbon that we can actually avoid creating in the atmosphere. And obviously, it's the bigger picture about the planet and everything that you hear from environmentalists, we've got to play our part. It's not a case of ducking and diving and saying, well, actually, it's going to cost far too much money to recycle this SSD, recover it. Yes, it's going to cost money, but we've got to step up and actually take their responsibility more seriously and take a, a note of these figures that we can actually improve on our carbon footprint as a company. The standard that's been uh, reissued in December of 2020, it talks all about how you recycle SSC and take it out of track, how you mark it up, where you need to cut it. So it's got all those um, guidelines in there. It probably needs a little bit more work to actually get us uh, to the stage where we can recycle certain SSD units to make sure we can actually get the assurance that they're still fit to go into CAT1 or CAT2 or CAT3 track, rather than actually just saying it's got to be low category siding, really, and we can get the benefit from that. But unfortunately, this was reissued in December 2020, but I'd like to say otherwise, but it feels like it's just been ignored, um, and the alliances and the renewal companies are not taking their responsibility about what this actually tells them they can do. So we'll be rebriefing that at the next quarterly standard brief for network rail people to actually get the message across that this standard exists, it needs to be considered and to take seriously, and in its current format, we could recover an awful lot more SSC out of their renewals portfolio and obviously get the benefits of actually looking to where we can recycle that or cascade the, uh, the assets. So, end of the presentation. So, any questions? Thank you. Can I just add to what you were saying earlier? Now, all out of 300, not very good. My experience recently on CSR, CRSA projects on Duddeston and the needs of sidings. They are low category tracks that we're putting back on the sidings. And it's the DPEs who are actually not agreeing to recycle, use recycled siding uh, turnouts and things. How do you reconcile, reconcile that in, in a way that you know it forces the DPA to actually look at the carbon footprint and make sure we are introducing, the, you know, SNC where we can at sites like that. I think it's. it's a, you're making them aware of our standard because they may or may not be aware of it um, in terms of taking it to a point where they, they understand what the content is. I think they are aware of it. I think the issue is, uh, feedback I'm getting is that 
it actually causes a maintenance issue for them long term. They feel that it's more of a hindrance for you know these I think the conditioned S and T rather than a new. Yeah, I think the, the problem we've got is, is perception. People have this perception: something's recycled, it's not as good as brand new. Therefore, it's going to fail earlier. There, I'm, I'm wasting my money. This is the experience of so senior guys. And we're, we're very open at Whitemore, and we're always willing for people to come down and see what we actually do. And I think if 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 people actually come and see what we can do at Whitemore yeah. and how thorough we can actually be on stuff and actually see what we produce, I think it would change their mind. Why can't you go one step further and sort of guarantee your products to say you won't have maintenance issues within reason? Well, or guarantee it's not worth anything, really. No, because you could have maintenance issues with a brand new... Well, well, if, if one does yeah, fail, yeah, yeah well, OK. So I think that, that argument... Would that give them more confidence at all to... There's some assurance that actually might more do with 5053 or 54. There's, I think these ultrasonics sometimes is where it's yeah, required. So if, it's, if it needs ultrasonics, we can get it ultrasonic tested. Um, and as you see, we've, we've got the facility to turn cast upside down. Yeah, yeah. So where we've seen it, we've seen it before where crossings have come back to us that have only been in track six months, brand new, but they're cracked underneath. Now, they've been given a certificate conformity from the manufacturer to say that they're brand new, they can go out, six months later it's cracked underneath. They don't check, nobody can check them underneath. When they come back to us, we, we check them all. So we can see if there's any cracks or anything starting in the cast itself from underneath that you don't normally see, we can see that um, and we can ad we can address it or say, look, looks fine on top, but underneath it's it's beyond economical repair. Yeah. I think that's I think that's the biggest, like Phil said, the big biggest um, conception out there is that using something that's been refurbished, um, oh, it's not good. It's already been out there. Been, but we done a. It was a good few years ago. Now it was a good six or seven years ago. Um, there was a side is it it was only a side in, but it was a side in's up in Newcastle and they wanted a specific crossing. We had a crossing, it was a fabricated one. It was nineteen sixty four. Now it was going back into a side in back then. Um, when we'd finished with it, it looked brand new. It looked brand new. And I believe uh, they got another three years out of that in the side ins before it had completely gone and needed to take it out again. So um I think until the to, to the culture changes of people that actually see what we can do, because we're the only department in Network Rail that can do it, there's still a lot of people that haven't seen what we can do, and they just, in their mind, it's no one new. But they've, they've, they've got to come and see what can actually be produced. I think the, the one thing is, there's certain people in the, I'm saying in this audience, but there's certain people in society who are like, oh, I'll buy a car, don't want to use one. But how many of us have bought a used car? And it's, it's the same scenario in that sense. Because you, it's perception again. Because a lot of the time, people see something that's used to focus on something brand new. Because I know it's got batteries at the time. <coughs> Not always the case, obviously. But clearly, it's actually trying to get people to understand that you can get this unit maybe refurbished or it might be nearly brand new anyway, and you'll get as much life out of it as the assets have got left. Rather, actually, it's going to fail within weeks. Yeah, I think with the carbon assessment tool that you're working on, I think it does need to come from you guys. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So you need to somehow. Yeah, we're, we're promoting. I mean, at the moment, we I'm talking with um, Transpennine Group Modification Project. They're keen as much well to get all their SSC out and recycle it, and making sure it goes back to be uh, assessed by more than obviously where they can. They'll use it on their own patch where where they can do the signing for the petition. Especially where it's uh, yeah, I've got a couple of questions from uh, online. So a couple of questions from Adam Williams. Uh, hopefully you can hear me, Adam. Uh, the first one is: How long before SSC starts appearing on composite sleepers? That's uh, been sleeper composites are only currently approved for basic E6 inch bearers. And once the SSC bearers are product approved, will they use these timbers? <coughs> S and C bearers for composites are being developed as we speak. So there's some work going on in PA at the moment to actually look at product acceptance for those. 
still a way off yet with some details that we need to sort out with manufacturers for those still to work through. But I think the goal is really, from Gareth Evans' point of view, head of track, um, is that we turn off the actual um, timber um, capability in the future. When that will be, I don't know. But the, uh, obviously, we need to understand how these perform in track for quite a while yet before we can get to that point. But ultimately, the goal is to, from a, an environmental point of view, we need to turn off the actual timber um, supply eventually. When that will be, it's a while away yet, but that's the actual objective. They are using the composite bearers in London Underground? Yes, they are. Yeah. So that is already happening? Uh, is that all SMC? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So when it comes to London Underground, being a little bit ahead of the game, when, when usually we're ahead of the game and they look at what we're doing, and obviously in this case, we're looking at how London mm -hmm. Underground have actually introduced their property bearers. It might be a different type of supply that we use anyway. So obviously it's an area where we are collaborating with them to understand what, what they've actually got as evidence that we can actually show. Clearly it's a very different tra track type in terms, in terms of speed and tonnage. So we obviously need to have a, a bit more of a... Is it for subsurface areas or... What the actual ground? Yeah. Um, for London Underground, I'm not sure. Okay. Something in subsurface near this, the the uh, fire approvals. I would imagine, yeah, we've, oh, we've had, yeah. had a bit of a, an issue with fire approvals for King's Cross Tunnel with normal sleepers. That's been resolved now, but there was a bit of a problem with I it. thought with the problem with composite was the fact that you did have issues with temperature and gauge. Yes, there is. And there's a lot. That's why people are reluctant to use that. I think there's been good feedback from other areas, not in tunnels, but um, yeah, there have been one or two issues that have had to be resolved in that respect, yes. Yeah. So I just wanted to say, I think it's worth getting support of the PWI uh, Climate Change Decarb Committee, which Joan Heary is the chair. So I think this is uh, something that PWI could help the industry with. And, uh, and I was thinking perhaps exchange of the curve of components between the uh, transport, in, the rail infrastructure body. So uh, one day perhaps uh, X uh, mainline used on uh, CFL assets. Yeah. Quite. Maybe on lighter oh. metros, Newcastle, and other. So we've got GBR. Fantastic stuff. Thanks. When GB Railway Railways comes into being as a, as a company, then it's going to give us that flexibility to actually look at the, the bigger networks, not just about the rail infrastructure. So, yeah, it's quite possible we can actually achieve that. One more from Adam Williams. Um, has White Wall considered offering a track facility to external bodies such as heritage railways to experience their role as C units being replaced? There may be a steady supply of older type units that could be a benefit in stock. We, we have supplied um, heritage railways with cut of bits, um, so we do sell, sell to external uh, customers as well, as well as internal customers. Um, and we do have a couple that have used us before, so they do often ask for us for stuff from us. The problem we tend to have with a lot of heritage railways, a lot of them use bullet. Um, and bullet stuff that comes back to us, we very rarely get it, and when we do get it, it is, it is destroyed, <laughs> um, and it's it's beyond, you'd spend far too much money on it, yeah. Bullet, not very often at all, no, not very often at all, but we, we do, yeah, we do, we do supply, we have supplied to Heritage Railway before, and if we can help them out in the future, then we will do. But for Bullhead, that's where uh, Heritage Railways need to speak to uh, you. Yes. Taking it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need, yeah. <laughs> it's getting it's getting very scarce, Bullhead now. Bullhead and inclined, uh, or flat bottom inclined. Um, that is 56 inclined. That's getting scarce as well because it's it's older uh, stuff now. So we don't. I think in, in terms of where White Milk is excelling those areas, it, it's those bespoke sort of units where you're looking at being finding difficulties in getting assets. Or replacement that White Milk can help out with those if it's actually aware of what's needed. It's clearly, going to the manufacturers these days, they're more concentrating on 70 to 60 than our 60 to 1 and 2. Any more questions? No, any more questions in the room? No? Okay. That's oh, great. Thank you very much. So, <coughs> from here. 
Right, I discovered a lot about uh, Whitemore, and uh, I'm very impressed by what you've been doing uh, there and the potential that uh, the facility has got for uh, the network rail, but being distributed overall, you know, to tackle the sustainability issues. Um, in range of sustainability, I noted, you know, ecology as well as you know, the more reuse uh, and reduce waste type of approach, um, as well as carbon footprint reduction. So uh, the full range, I think, <laughs> including you know, the economical aspect of it, as well as being covered, uh, being covered by what you do. Um, and the, the other thing I noticed was uh, quite impressed with as well is the fact that you're able to get the railway uh, help we should get the railway up and running very, very quickly and reaction time is got on, on how you can help, you know, maintenance teams actually to, um, uh, to get um, components that would take uh, otherwise a long time and expensive to, to get. So, um, so I would like to thank you very much for, uh, for the presentation today and ask people in the room and uh, online as well if they can to join uh, us in taking you in the normal way. So before I close anything, uh